Okay, so the flipped lecture was on the central dogma. Um, first, like, okay, let's try it. It worked pretty well last time. What were the main themes of this lecture? Replication, Replication for sure. That was on my list of correct answers. Replication. What else? Let's, we'll map these things out for review. What else? That was the first lecture. Enzymes, yes, okay. So it was not only central dogma and replication, these were the focus, focuses. And you probably learned about replication before, you probably learned about central dogma before. What I'm filling in now are kind of like the key details. And some of the key details, so remember this time around are like the names, like the names of the enzymes, the key players. So that was for sure, um, part of it was enzymes, but not just any enzymes, it was very, very specific enzymes that you have to remember their names, which play the roles of in doing replication and in the central dogma. So that was definitely like enzyme names was one of the themes that you're supposed to take home. So that's good that you got that. Any others? Any other things you took home? DNA structure. DNA structure, what about it? Like what about it was it? Three, three, five. Yes, direction. Excellent. Direction of the DNA, five to three, four, three to five. That was super important. And I went over that a little bit last time, and this is sort of putting it now into context of the actual polymer of the DNA molecule within the context of replication. Um, what other names so somebody said enzyme names, enzymes. What what enzymes can we remember from that lecture? This list them. What's off the top of your head? This is actually an interview question I ask is when I interview people I say, can you name any genes? And people who know details can name genes. What? Polymerase. Yes. Polymerase, helicase, what else? Ligase, okay, what else? Primase. Primase. Anything else? Nucleases. Uh, nucleases, yes. Me methionics. Methylase? Methylase. Methylase, we'll put these together. Um, okay, good, excellent, excellent. Very good, you're good, this is working. Okay, so the reason why, again, like, this class is focused, really focused on building stuff. Um, but before you can build stuff, you need to kind of like know your tools, like, and know your little building blocks, okay? So these, and the focus of that lecture was to sort of set up um, your understanding of the tools that we use in molecular biology. And I made this point that biotechnology and molecular biology sort of like mimics the process of how cells actually do these things like replication, in the cell, it mimics it in a test tube. And we mimic it by actually using the players, the enzymes, taking them and putting them in two. So it's important to remember their names because if you set up a PCR reaction, you have to add a polymerase or you can't write the DNA, right? And we don't actually add a helicase, but we have to split apart the DNA. So in the way that we do it in the test tube is we heat, up, heat it up and it splits it apart. If we do cloning experiments, I'll talk a lot later about ligase, where you have to add that into your test tube. Um, primase we don't add, but that's because we have, we build our own primers for PCR. So like all these components, it's important to remember who they are and what they do, because you have to do those same things in the lab when you set up molecular biology experiments, okay? So let's elaborate on replication. How does it happen in the cell? So the other thing I set up is in this lecture, I set up a dichotomy where I first showed you how replication happens in the cell, 
And then I showed you how replication happens in the test tube for biotechnology by means of PCI. So walk me through the process of replication in the cell. Let's, let's first, let's just start with Here's our DNA. Walk me through what has to happen. Yes, so the first thing is you can't replicate DNA without a template. And the template is the other half of the molecule. So these are two molecules that bind together. You can't replicate without the template. In the cell, how does it quote unquote denature? The helicase. The helicase. So the helicase pops on, helicase pops on, and it unwinds it, splits it open. So it should be three, it should be five. Okay. Helicase has done its job. Then what happens? What happens after it's opened up? Primase comes in. Primase comes and, and does what? Primes the uh, lagging strand, leading strand. Well, it'll prime both. It'll prime, it'll prime only once for the, the leading strand. Let's see, if I'm gonna actually draw this co correctly, the polymerases read uphill, which is three to five. So they'd be reading this. So this would be the leading, and this would be the lagging. So primase would come in and prime. Before, before this even happens, let me, let's step back, let's rewind. Let's, let's step back from primase. Let's step back from, let me just write these in now. Primase, helicase. Let's step back to step zero, how does it know like where to start the process? Like DNA is like a long molecule, a long polymer. How does it know like where to start replicating? Is it, what? No, it's not a start codon. That comes in translation later So we make protein. Here we're talking about nucleic acids, replicating nucleic acids, different type of molecule. How does it know where to start? The origin. Yes, good. The origin. You want to remember this, this, it's a key word. This, this comes up a lot in molecular biology, the origin. There's an origin. What is an origin? Like, what is it? Describe it for me. What is it made out of? DNA. It's DNA. Okay, so it's a nucleic acid. <laughs> that, 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 that's not always obvious. It could have been a protein. It could have been a protein marking a spot, right? But it's not. It's DNA. It's DNA. So it's a sequence of DNA. It's a special sequence. So there's some combination of A's, T's, G's, C's, which the cell can read as a word that means origin. This is the origin. Okay, I don't know what the sequence is. Sequence probably varies organism to organism, but there's a sequence of ACE, T's, G's, C's that signals for the origin. And what does the origin do? So it's a sequence. What would it do? It's not an enzyme, so it can't like actually verbally do anything, but like what happens? What does it do to start the process? What would you think? Recruits. That's a good way to say it. It recruits, it recruits like the, I'm not sure if it's helicase. It might actually be like a, a, a transcription factor or something, not a transcription factor, but there could be like an intermediate that pulls in helicase, but recruits is a good word. So it's essentially like a flag. It's essentially like a sequence that is going to recruit some kind of a DNA binding protein. It could initially immediately be helicase, but it's going to start recruiting the factors that start this process. And they only get recruited to the origin, okay? They don't start replicating the DNA everywhere. It doesn't just pop open and helicase is just binding like everywhere. It only starts at the origin because the origin is a special sequence that's recruiting these factors to come to that site to start replication. Okay, so it recruits, 
That is actually the language you see. Like it recruits, um, and later on I say, um, I say it recruits polymerase. But when I say that, I'm kind of saying that colloquially, like there's, there could be intermediates that recruits X, that recruits Y, that recruits polymerase. But it recruits these factors to the site. Why would it not want to replicate DNA everywhere? Well, that's not true. The whole chromosome will be replicated. You definitely want to replicate all your DNA or you're going to start losing chromosomes. Why would, it, why would the cell want to regulate the origin of replication? Where it is? And like how many there are? Why would it want to do that? Because it's energy expensive. Yes, okay, that's a good one. It's, it's expensive. Like, it be, like a good place to start, kind of like a checklist. Probably, like that, that's a good answer. I don't know how to like explain that molecularly, but it's probably like there's probably some, imagine you have a chromosome that's this long, like to get it done in a speedy process, you probably need origins spaced at some regular interval geographically to like make sure that the whole thing gets replicated within the 20 minute cycle of mitosis or whatever. So that's probably true. Um, I forgot what you said. What was your language? I said kind of like a, like a checklist, like a starting point. So, I don't know. How to I'm going to phrase it as location. Location is important. Or, to, or like division. Maybe you call these quantizations or like aliquots. Aliquots of kind of like this needs to rep get replicated. This does, this does. There's kind of something else that's more dangerous that I'm really like hinting towards. Like, there, why would it be. Damage? Is there a damage or something? Or? Well, this is good if there's damage because it opens it up and can access it to, to be fixed. So this is actually what happens if it is damaged. Um, but like, why would you not want things always being replicated? Or are you saying like when it opens it up, it exposes it to damage? Is that what you're saying? So maybe- Well, I was just saying like, just in case there was damage, you might not want to replicate the entire thing or? Well, I think replication would, whether it's damaged or not, you have to replicate it or you're dead the next generation. Right. So it's kind of so it's kind of <laughs> like even if it's damaged, you gotta go for it. It has to be replicated, or you're just gonna die. Um, I mean, isn't isn't uncontrolled replication technically cancer? Yes. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Is like uncontrolled replication is going to be a huge problem because you only need two sets of chromosomes for each cell's next generation. You're diploid, so you have your mom's copies and your dad's copies. Um, and you need to copy those. But you only need two copies. You don't want four copies or six copies or 20 copies because that is what happens in cancer. That like HeLa cells, the famous like cancerous HeLa cells, they have like 23 copies of each chromosome. They're, it's what's called aneuploid. Aneuploid. So there's diploid, haploid. What is haploid? One, one set. What is diploid? Two sets. And aneuploid is like a whole bunch of sets. Like it's a random number. You don't want to be, like there's some context you might want certain cells to be aneuploid. But for the most part, you don't want your cells to become aneuploid. That's a huge problem. It's a huge waste of energy. It's expensive. Um, and it's going to probably cause things like cancer. Okay. So it's a huge problem, and the cell does not just want to be replicating everywhere, it wants to replicate at the origin. Okay, so we figured out origin. Stuff happens at the origin. Now let's go forward. We talked about helicase. We were at primase. So primase is doing what? Primes with a small oligo. What does that mean? Like, explain that to me. Yes, it's true. Primase primes with a small oligo. What is an oligo? Um, like a of yeah, it's a little string. It's a little string of nucleotides. So we now know what nucleotides are. It's the it's like the DNTPs. Although when they come string together, they lose the two of the phosphates. 
but it's a string of those nucleotides, okay? So oligo, when I say oligos in the lab, I'm thinking usually like 25 base pairs. I don't know how many precisely primase is priming with, but when we use primers in the lab, they're about like 25 base pairs. Okay, so primase is gonna prime in the leading and the lagging. And then what's gonna happen after there's these prime sites, and these prime sites are matching matching A's, T's, G's, and C's. What happens now? Why does prime A's prime? Like, why would it do that? Because then polymerase can read. What has to happen even before it can like read and write? It's gotta like, it's gotta actually like, you, we, we have to start envisioning like molecular biology like we're there looking at the physical space. The polymerase, it doesn't just float around, like it actually needs something to grab onto, okay? And it needs double-stranded DNA to like hold onto. It can't grab here because it's a single strand. So the polymerase grabs onto the double-stranded DNA sites where it's primed, okay? and then it can start reading and writing. But it's always actually holding on to double-stranded DNA because as it reads, it's filling in, filling in and making the other molecule, right? Okay, so in the leading strand, because DNA is directional, and I drew it all out for you in the lecture, in the leading strand, the polymerase is reading three to five. That means it's, it's moving this way, three to five but it's writing the complement strand, which is five to three, okay? And I drew that in the lecture with like, oh, there's this triangle, here's five, here's three. And actually how I remember it is, you think ribosomes are like these fat things, so they would like roll down, they would like roll down the hill. So ribosomes always read five to three in messenger RNA. But polymerases, I think, I just envision like, okay, they're smaller. They can like go up, they're more fit. They can like go up hill. But they write downhill. That's just like little stupid stuff to kind of remember. You want to remember this, because this actually like becomes important. And I know like when I originally took biology, this was just some detail that I was like, eh, forget that. That's kind of like really complicated. I don't really understand the difference between five, three, three, five. It doesn't make any sense, it's useless. It's actually like super important. Um, so you want to know this. And you kind of want to be able to draw it, like I'm drawing it up for here, winging it. Hopefully I'm getting that right. Um, and then, because it can only read in one direction, it can only write in one direction, it can't just, it can't just zip, zip up this way, because this strand is actually the opposite direction, okay? It's the left hand to the right hand. So it has to read backwards, or it's forwards. And it's going like that. And these just perpetually continue as it goes, right? That all makes sense, right? That should be all review, with just adding in, remembering details, directionality, and a little bit more specificity. Okay, that's replication in the cell. So we're not even at central dogma yet. We're not even there. We're at, we're at replicating. How is it going to replicate in PCR? Why, what is PCR and why do we use it? Why do molecular biologists and scientists need to also replicate DNA? Why? Test out if whatever they modify the words. Did you say to test to modify the words? No, to test out whatever they modify words. Yeah, to do experiments to do experiments. Um, and and uh, people often don't realize this, to do an experiment, so we're talking about DNA molecules. Have you ever seen and touched a DNA molecule? Like, well, I suppose you have like, because they're a part of you, but like, these are tiny, tiny, tiny things. And you can't really like do empirical experiments on things that are so small, unless you can generate billions of copies of them. And then if you can make copies, then you can have a lot of quantity to work with and you can do experiments. So a lot of times, I mean, that's the gist of PCR, polymerase chain reaction. PCR is a methodology to amplify specific sequences to replicate them so that we can do experiments with them. And we do it 
we do the same steps that the cell that the cell uses thinking along along this line we do the same steps but we do them differently a little bit how is it different in pcr yeah Yep, so, okay, so step one is denature. And we, we do it in a thermocycler. So we just heat it up, that rips the DNA apart. So instead of adding an enzyme helicase, why can't the cell just heat it up and rip it apart? Like, why would the cell need an enzyme helicase if, if we can just do it in a- Yeah, you would kill yourself, exactly. You'd like rip yourself apart. So you don't want to heat up your body and rip apart your DNA. Um, you just want to do that under certain contexts in it too. Okay, so it denatures. Um, we denature with heat. What's like a typical denature temperature? It's like 98 degrees Celsius. It depends on the enzyme, it can vary, um, but we usually use like 98 degrees Celsius. What happens next? Do you use primase? Do we use primase? If we, do we mix primase in PCR reactions? Or do you have to make your own primase? We make our own primase. So instead of in the cell, primase was coming. It was actually an enzyme. It was finding DNA and it was making a little prime that matched. We don't, we don't do that. What we do is we sort of skip, skip that step. We leave the primase out of it and we just make our own primase. Okay, and why would we want to do that? So imagine you have a DNA strand. Why would we want to make our own primers? Exactly, so it does exactly what we want. So in a typical PCR reaction, there's two primers, two primers. One would be a forward, and the forward is going to be a five to three direction. Okay, so it's actually going to be matching the three to five. So this would be your forward primer. So you'd be matching this. Then we have a reverse primer. So you're essentially designing primers that are flanking a sequence you want to see. And reverse primer is going to be like this. And if this strand is five, three, this one would be three to five. So when you actually, when you make this primer, you actually have to take the sequence and you do what's called taking the reverse complement, flipping it to make it so that it reads backwards. I'll show you how to do that later. This is why direction and the five to three, three to five becomes important because when you actually start designing your PCR primers, you actually have to understand what direction you're looking in or your PCRs will never work, okay? So, then what happens? So we have a priming step, but it's with primers, and we call this, what do we call this? Annealing. Annealing. So we're, probably spelled it wrong, but we're lowering the temperature, so it's usually typically around 56. We lower the temperature, just hot enough we're just cool enough so our primers combine. How do we know what that temperature is going to be? Depends on hydrogen bond. Yes, that's why that was like the whole purpose of the first lecture. Like that was the whole purpose. It's going to depend on the A's, T's, G's, C content of the primers that you pick. Okay, so if you have like 50 G's and C's, it's not going to work because that annealing temperature would bind too tight. That annealing temperature would be too hot. If it's like a whole bunch of A's, it's going to be too low. It's going to be too like not. Nah, it's going to be too. It's going to be more like 40. Okay. So we, when we design primers, we pick sequences that have just good enough A's and T content that it's around 56 degrees Celsius annealing temperature. So we actually set that. We pick this and we can vary it. And what we pick depends on the primers that we pick, the ATGC content, because GCs have three, ATGCs have two. Good. Then what happens? What's the third step? Extension. extension. Okay. And for extension to happen, we're going to need what in the tube? 
a polymerase, a polymerase. Fusion is a specific name of a polymerase, a high fidelity one. So extinction is going to require a polymerase. So the polymerase is now going to, we tricked it. It's going to see this, these little sites. It thinks primase, just primed them. It's going to grab on. It's going to start writing. Imagine this is a genome. What's going to make it stop? What? Nope, it's going to keep going. It's literally, the first time you do this, it's literally going to go on forever. It's going to keep going. It's going to keep writing, and it's going to write, for the first reaction, it's going to write a giant thing going this way, and it's going to write a giant thing going this way. So how come this whole thing doesn't get amplified? How come just a little piece gets amplified? What? Yeah, yes, it's because we do it again. We, this PCR is an iterative process. The first reaction, we actually get stuff we don't want. We get a whole bunch of stuff we don't want on the ends, okay? But what happens the next time is this one, this one from this primer only started here. So it's only long on one side. And this one from this side started here, so it's only long on the other side, okay? And then when you do it again, you denature, we repeat, you denature, everything rips apart, okay? Then we lower temperature and anneal, and now your primers, now your primers, this primer now is going to anneal perhaps to this long thing that we just made. It's gonna start here. And then the next primer will anneal at this other long one, but it'll cut it off right here, okay? So in the next batch, in the next batch of things that amplify, I'll draw out what you'll see. So on the next round of PCR, you have something that looks like this, right? Something that's too long on this end, if this is our amplicon, too long on this end, too long on this end. But now your primer is binding here, and then this one your primer is binding here. Now it gets amplified. The next round, round two, just this. It goes to the end and it stops because there's nothing left. It goes to the end and it stops because there's nothing left. Now in round three, there's these little guys. And now what's being amplified is in round three, the primers are binding this. And now in round four, there's quadruple the little ones. And then in round five, there's quadruple whatever the little ones. And it goes on exponentially until all that's left is essentially these, a whole bunch of copies of these little ones, okay? If that's confusing for you, it's because you haven't taken the time to draw it out yourself. What needs to happen is take the insights that I've just shown you and try to actually mentally draw out, okay, if I'm gonna do a PCR, here's what happens the first round. Here's what happens the second round. Here's what happens the third round. And actually try to make the products and prime the primers and see what you get. See if you can figure it out. Then you'll understand it. What time is it? 3.30. Okay, so I have 20 minutes. We're not even at Central Dogma yet. Um, let's see, is there anything left? The last thing I want to say about PCR while we're here, what goes in the tube? Like, let's list out the reagents. What goes in the tube? Polymerase, yep, good. Definitely need polymerase. What else goes in the tube? The buffer. All enzymes need like a solution and they have things that they like. So like um, nucleases often require magnesium. Polymerases also require often magnesium. So there's a buffer that has magnesium in it usually. But there's a buffer that helps the polymerase. The function of the buffer is to help the polymerase function. What else is in the tube? Primers, how many? Forward. Yep, forward and reverse. And we'll talk about like how to set this up. Um, these would be at 10 micromolar, but I, you don't have to worry about that now. Just you want to know forward and reverse, two primers. What else? Template. template. What would you? What is your template? 
Like it's like the thing you're trying to amplify. So it's probably original source DNA that you extracted. If you're like doing analysis of a plant, it came from a plant and you took a leaf and you extracted DNA. You made that and then you added that template into your reaction. What else is in there? Water. Water. We're missing a key thing. Ligase. Nope, we're not cloning. We're not doing ligase. We're not ligating anything. Ligase is only relevant in the cell because of the Okazagi fragments. It's got to seal those. We don't have any Okazagi fragments in PCR because we're just amplifying our little section. We're not sealing anything. So we don't have to seal the phosphate backbone, but we'll get to ligase but it's not in a PCR. What's the final thing that you're missing? It was a big player in lecture one. How do you make DNA? What do you need? What is it made out of? Amino acids. It's, DNA is not made out of amino acids. Nucleotides. Protein, nucleotides, and actually they're called DNTPs. Deoxynucleotide triphosphates. So we have to put DNTPs, and there's actually four of them. You need A's, T's, G's, and C's. Otherwise you can't write in. This is actually physically what you put in a PCR tube. Now, because you understand it, it would be expected you could go into the lab and I could say, set up a PCR. And you'd be like, okay, I know what's in it. Show me where the DNTPs are in the freezer. What, what polymerase are you using? What buffer goes with that polymerase? Show me which water you want me to use. What's your template? Oh, I better design my props. But like, you understand the process now. Yes? I have two questions. What do you have written for number two? BFR, buffer. Sorry. And my other question was, does the template have to be a waste cell or could it be a whole cell? That's a good question. Okay, this is, I like this question. Let's, let's, let's dive deeper. Um, so the question is, does the template have to be lysed cells or live cells? Okay, most of the time it's needed. Most of the time what we're adding is purified DNA. So we previously lysed the cells and we got rid of all their proteins, all their lipids, all their carbohydrates. We just have their nucleic acids. There's a purification process through which we can do that. So most of the time we're adding purified DNA okay, through organic chemistry reaction, which is why organic chemistry is important. But what you're saying is actually a, a, an advanced PCR technique called colony PCR. Okay, this is not going to be on the test. This is just, I like, we can talk about advanced things if they come up in the questions. This is what, this is the whole purpose of the flipped class. Okay, so you can actually take cells and so imagine you have some bacteria growing on a plate. They grow in colonies, these little, these little round things. Uh, and imagine you can take a toothpick. Imagine you want to know what that is. Many times when you're dealing with colonies, you've got hundreds or thousands. Okay, you take a toothpick, you poke that, then what's on that toothpick are little bacterial cells, and you use that toothpick, you put it into your PCR reaction, so you're not actually adding purified DNA, you're adding whole cells. And then what happens to the cells when you go through the first round of denature at 98 degrees Celsius, what happens? They explode and then you release their DNA into the PCR tube, which now becomes your template. That's an advanced technique because you're adding a very small quantity of template, um, although in some, certain, certain, yeah, in some certain circumstances, it's probably not small if you have like a giant blob of, of colony, but it's typically not what we do because you typically get better reactions if you purify the DNA first. So the alternative would be to grow up this bacteria, do a DNA extraction, then stick that in. But colony PCR would skip that step, speed up your process, which is why it's like an advanced technique. Would you run PCR more times if you did that? Run the cycles a lot more or less? Yeah, like do it longer. Wait, you saying are you saying longer extension time or are you saying longer, more iterative cycles? More cycles. Um, I would not change the number of cycles, although I'm sure Colony PCR has a precise protocol. You kind of look at the protocol and you would have to optimize it for your experiment. But a good question. <clears throat> Following up on that, on PCR, how, how would we, the, these are cycles where we do program times, okay? So 
usually 98 degrees Celsius, the denature is usually about, there's an initial denature, but then usually you only need about 10, 10 seconds in good polymerases. And then you go to the annealing, which I said is usually about 56. That's usually about 30 seconds. The one thing we vary time on is the extension. So that's the step three with the polymerase. And that's usually at 72 degrees Celsius, depending on your polymerase. How long, how long do we know, how long does it take to write DNA? I talked about that in that lecture actually. Like how long should we let the thermocycler sit here while it's writing? Depends on the rate you say is it five seconds? Does it depend? Like, does it change? Yeah. Why? What would be the factor that causes it to change? Um, Can't hear. You gotta like shout. The rate at which polymerase. The uh, speed. I, like I said, envision these things are like physical things. It's actually like building the blocks. Okay. It it and there's actually a time constraint. The fast polymerases can only write. Um, I think it's a thousand base pairs. Per, now I'm getting, my, my knowledge is getting is. I think it's part, 17 seconds. I think it's usually 15 seconds. Fusion, fusion is a thousand base pairs for 15 seconds. Or, what is it, five? 20? 15, three zero. Three zero, 30 seconds for a thousand base pairs? 15 for fusion, that's what you had in the video. Yeah, that's what I said, 15 seconds for fusion. It's gonna depend on the enzyme, but this is like a fast one. Thousand base pairs per 15 seconds. A slow one like TAC, which you always use in the classical labs is TAC polymerase because that's the crappiest, it's the cheapest, that's what they give you guys to work with. Um, that one writes really slowly. It's like, um, I think it's like, what is it? Well, yeah, it's 60 seconds. It's like a thousand base pairs per 60 seconds. So depending on the length of your amplicon, you actually have to choose this, the time of your extension to correlate with what polymerase you're using. And like, like I said, these are our tools. This is our toolkit. And some tools are nice and some tools are crappy. And you have to know, are you using a good tool or a bad tool and optimize your experiment for that tool. How much time do I have left? 13 minutes. Okay, good. Now we can hit the central dogma. <laughs> uh, okay. But replication is important because that's the entire focus of like all life. Like that's literally like why you exist is because your genes are interested in replicating themselves. And yes, so, okay, so replication is important. That was my point. Um, what is the central dogma? Just tell it to me. DNA transcribed RNA transcribed the verb. Yes, DNA transcribed the verb. Don't ever forget this ever again for the rest of your life. To RNA. And you said, what was the other one? Translated. Translated to protein. Don't ever forget this for the rest of your life. And these are hard. You get them confused a lot when you're first like learning them. But again, what, what really sort of like, um, allows you to show that you know the special details is never getting these confused. When you're talking with a professor and you say, I'm talking about transcription, I'm talking about translation, and you know what that means. If you're talking about translation, that means to me automatically you're talking about protein. If you're talking about transcription, I automatically think messenger RNA. So all the time I'm interacting with students and they're talking about transcription, transcription, but what they really mean is protein. That sort of like signals to me like you don't know what you're talking about. So don't ever forget this, especially because like this is like fundamentals. And what, really what's worth like memorizing are the fundamentals. So don't forget this. Now there's other some details which I'm adding into this, which is the names of the enzymes. So what's the name of the enzyme that does, trans, I wrote transcript, but I'm thinking transcription. What's the enzyme called? RNA polymerase, RNA, or you'll see RNA Paul. RNA polymerase is what does transcription. Okay, so what we first talked about for the first 40 minutes was essentially DNA polymerase. I was right, DNA poly, DNA, it's actually DNA Paul, 
That's what does replicates DNA. RNA Paul does transcription. Then what does this? Ribosome. Okay, good. This should again, this should be review. Ribosome. And the ribosome, now see, we're talking about proteins. RNA polymerase is a protein. Ribosome is a nucleoprotein complex. It's actually many proteins together to build a machine. DNA polymerase is a protein. What is the enzyme that I talked about that can go this way? Reverse transcriptase. And this is important because in molecular biology, if you ever want to study messenger RNA, you're always using reverse transcriptase. Because you really actually utilize RNA molecules, usually what you're doing is you're taking the RNA and you're converting it to DNA. So when they test you for COVID and they do the RNA test, what they're actually doing is they're extracting a tiny, tiny, minuscule amount of RNA, they're running a reverse transcriptase reaction, making DNA, and then they're actually doing a PCR on that DNA, okay? So if you understand the central dogma, you can actually understand like these tests and all these things that molecular biologists are doing if you just understand central dogma. Um, now how much time do I have? Nine. Nine, okay, good, okay, I can slow down. Let's do something interesting. Let's go through transcription. Now, similar to how we started with DNA replication, walk me through transcription. How does it happen? What, what should I be looking at? What should I first draw? What does transcription get done to? Transcription is a verb that's acting on what? DNA. DNA. Okay, good. So transcription, so I first need a DNA molecule. Okay. <coughs> Now what happens? Um, yes, excellent, okay. So there's gotta be, so first of all, what we're actually looking at when we're talking about transcription is a special kind of DNA. It's not just any DNA, it's actually a gene. We're looking at a gene. Transcription occurs at genes, on genes. Only genes, although with some caveats, okay? And each gene has a promoter. They're designated like this. What are promoters? They're sequences that recruit transcription factors. Yes, excellent. They're sequences that recruit, you said it perfect. Sequences that recruit transcription factors. I just say these are like the light switches on off. Okay, why would genes, why would you not want them on all the time? Run up your energy bill. Yes, exactly. Like. Oh, certain genes are only good under certain circumstances. You don't want to just always be synthesizing everything, okay? So genes are heavily regulated in all organisms. They're able to be turned on and off. And actually the regulation gets actually extremely complex and I go into some of the details. But for now, let's go from here. So a transcription factor, you said they recruit transcription factors, TF. If you see TF, that means transcription factor. Then what happens? What does the transcription factor do? Yes, it recruits which polymerase? Uh, RNA. RNA Paul. So RNA Paul now sneezes, see, yeah, not sneezes, sees where it needs to go because of this transcription factor that it likes to bind to. How is it going to know how to bind to it? How does this interaction happen? What is RNA Paul made of? Again, like building blocks. What is RNA Paul made of? What is it? The protein, what is it made out of? Amino. Amino acids. So how would this interaction probably occur? Between, yeah, like charge between like amino acids. There's probably gonna be maybe some charge interactions or some polar interactions between charged or polar amino acids in this specific transcription factor with this specific RNA polymerase that causes it to see this and to pop on. Things don't just magically happen. That's why knowing your amino acids is important because people actually like study this. They're actually looking at, okay, like what are the residues that are like interacting? Maybe there's a positive and a negative that form an ionic bond 
and then that's what pulls this thing here and then it starts. Okay, so it starts, then what happens? It reads a direction, they read uphill, so they read three to five, and they can write, so they're writing five to three, and this is a special thing that they're writing. What is it called? Messenger RNA. They're writing messenger RNA, right? Yes? Yes, you with me? Okay, they're writing messenger RNA. That's transcription. How does it know when to stop? Does it just write forever? A terminator. Okay, so there's another part of the gene. Okay, this is actually a second interview question that I always ask future students. Is I say, describe to me the structural elements of a gene, okay? And if I hear people say, promoter, terminator, start codon, intron exon, double helix. If I hear people say stuff like that, I know, okay, this is a person that knows like the details. I can work with this person. So just so you know it, these things are important. Um, how does it know when to stop? The terminator, there's a terminator. What happens at the terminator? So it reads through, it hits the terminator, it's reading the terminator. The RNA polymerase is over here now. It's spitting out this molecule. What happens? How does it know when to stop? How does it know that that's a terminator? What happens? Like the sequence? Yes, you're right. Very good. But what does the sequence do? Um, does it attract a protein that comes in overall? Yes. So that's one. That's one mechanism of quote unquote termination. Is as it's reading this. What's coming off the end, the terminator starts popping off on the end, and it will attract another protein, okay, which has some kind of a RNA binding domain, and it will bind it, and maybe it can read it faster, and so it's, it reads what's coming out, and then it catches up, and then as soon as it hits it, it like knocks it off, okay? And there's actually very specific like structural motives that these things can see and cause these things to knock off. Okay, I think that's, what is that, row-dependent termination? Is that at the end there? Yes, no? Yes. Yes, okay. There's another mechanism of termination. Yes, the hairpins. So this messenger RNA, is it single-stranded or double-stranded? Okay, it's single-stranded, so it's got A's, U's, G's, and C's, and they're exposed. So they're looking to fill their hydrogen bonds they're looking to grab onto stuff, and if they see a matching sequence come out, they fold, they fold and form a hairpin, and there are conditions under which these hairpins can knock off the RNA polymerase. Does that make sense? So again, like you've, you've heard all this stuff before. This should be review. But I'm trying to show to you like the molecular details of how this is actually like, mechanistically happening. And it's important that you understand this. Do I have any time left? Two minutes, okay. Any questions? Trans let's quick do translation. The final step in the central dogma. So we got this nice messenger RNA molecule. I usually draw messenger RNA squiggly like this because it's single stranded. Now what happens? How does translation happen? It will not let you leave until we finish this. What's key for translation? What does the translation? tRNA is key and ribosome. So okay, how does a ribosome how does the ribosome find this thing? How does it know like where to start? Yes. Um, there's a very good. Okay, so there's usually little um, what are called ribosomal binding sites, and one of these is a shine delgarno. I think that's the bacterial one, and then I think in eukaryotes it's a Cozak sequence. Very good. Um, and this is a sequence of messenger RNA that the ribosome can interact with. 
and there's an interaction and then it starts, okay? Now the ribosome starts feeding in the transcript. Okay, it's feeding it, it's reading it, it's reading it downhill because it's fat and it's going down the hill and now it starts translating. So I heard tRNA. What is tRNA? What kind of molecule of the four is tRNA? Is it a protein or is it a... What? Is it a nucleotide? It's a nucleic acid. So it's many nucleotides. It's an RNA. It's a tiny RNA molecule. But it's a special one, which is why we call it tRNA. T tRNA. The tRNA. So it's a nucleic acid. Remember the four different types of nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids. It's a nucleic acid, okay, and it binds... Um, what does it bind? It is a codon, and it binds. Um, it binds the amino acids. So imagine this is an amino acid. Imagine this is. Imagine this is glycine, the simplest amino acid. And the tRNA, once it's loaded with the amino acids, gets to the ribosome, and it feeds it into the ribosome. The ribosome takes these amino acids and then strings together, which you typically see as this, which is the protein, which then folds. How does it know where to start the protein? So it found, it found the RNA at the Shine del Garno, but how does it know when to start compiling in the amino acids? Yes, there's a start codon which it sees is ATG. It's only one start codon. Don't forget that, ATG. It codes for a very specific amino acid named methionine. Every single protein starts with methionine. It just kind of blew my mind when I realized this. Every protein, you look at the database, always starts with methionine. That's because ATG codes for methionine. It makes sense, right? Okay. But most often, these methionines later get cleaved off. Okay. But it starts it at methionine. How does it know when to stop? It sees a stop codon. There's three, tag, TAA, or TGA. It sees one of these, it stops making the protein. Now here's a question, final question, is once a ribosome sees this, what happens to the ribosome? So the protein is finished, it made the protein, but the ribosome is still bound to the messenger RNA. What happens? Usually there's like a sequence that like pops it off, I think. Actually, I don't know. Some, it might keep going. And actually in some certain, su certain contexts, it can keep going and it can make like alternative proteins. But for the most part, what happens is ATG, it sees the stop codon and then the protein's done. Okay, that's, that's the end. Does that make sense? So next lecture, Friday, I'm debating. Um, there's two lectures. Um, one lecture is the lecture on the lab lecture, which is like a lecture on, um, it's a lecture on like basic lab techniques. I really think you should watch that. So that's the lecture I'm gonna assign, but that's not the lecture I'm gonna talk about. I'll talk about something different on Friday. But watch that lecture, it is the lab solutions lecture. Are you going to talk about the numbers for the data? The data? I'm going to, uh, uh, let me stop this. What am I going to talk about? I did the 